Hello everyone, welcome to the first module in uh, week 10. Uh, so uh, this week we are going to continue uh, looking at uh, recursive state estimation uh, question, right? Uh, so uh, in the last week we looked at uh, the base filter algorithm, right? Uh, and so essentially, uh, so this is how it operated. Uh, so we were given uh, the belief uh, in the previous state, right? And then we had the, uh, the control action ut and also the measurement or observation ZT that we made. And based on this, uh, we ended up computing uh, the, the revised belief for the state XT, right? Uh, for the time step T, right? And the way we did this is we first computed bell bar XT, which is essentially applying the uh, motion model, which is given by P of XT given UT XT minus one, right? Applying the motion model on the belief state, right? On the prior belief state, and then making a correction update or, or a measurement update uh, based on the actual uh, sensory inputs that we get or the measurements that we need. And there we use the measurement model, which is P of ZT given XT and with the, the bell bar that we computed in between, right? So this is essentially uh, the structure of the base filter algorithm. This is the same structure we will be following for all the algorithms that we will be looking at this week as well, okay? Uh, so one of the uh, important things I want to remind you is that when we looked at the base filter algorithm, it is more of a conceptual algorithm, right? So uh, I did say that uh, uh, for practical implementation, we will run into problems computing uh, this eta. So we had to look at uh, simpler versions where we make assumptions about the model, right? So in the base filter algorithm that we looked at, we made no assumptions about the transition model, right? So it could be of any form, right? And similarly, we made no assumptions about the belief distribution, nor about the measurement model itself, right? So all of these were assumed to be arbitrary probability distributions or mass functions, uh, which we could then uh, manipulate, right? And, and the very simple example that we looked at, uh, they were all uh, uh, multinomial uh, distributions. In fact, they were all uh, binomial because there were just only two uh, outcomes uh, that we were uh, looking at, right? And uh, uh, that's the setup that we had last week, right? So this week, we will first start looking at a family of algorithms called the uh, 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 Gaussian filter algorithms, right? So here, the basic assumption with Gaussian filter algorithms is that the, the family of belief distributions that we are going to use, right? The belief distributions are going to come from a multivariate normal distribution, right? So the multivariate normal distribution here, which we will denote by the symbol n of mu comma sigma, where mu is the mean of this distribution, Right? And sigma is the covariance matrix. Right? So you should be familiar with this, uh, if not earlier, at least after looking at the uh, revision videos from uh, uh, last week. Right? So the density itself is given, the probability of x uh, for uh, uh, under the normal distribution n mu sigma is actually given by uh, this expression, as you know. Right? So it's 1 by 2 pi, uh, root 2 pi, really, root 2 pi sigma and e power x minus mu squared by sigma, right? So this is what we know from the univariate and the, the, the multivariate version is this. And the idea behind uh, the uh, using this is that uh, my belief state is going to be such that there is one true state, right? And I have some margin of uncertainty around the true state. So if you look at the figure here, so the true state will be somewhere there, right? Right. The true state will be somewhere there, and I have some kind of uncertainty around what the true state is, and that is represented by the Gaussian distribution. So that would mean that at every point of time, my belief is such that there is some known true state and uncertainty around that, right? So this is fine. So if you think about how we were doing it earlier, right? So earlier, let us say that there were like five different states that the uh, a robot could be in, I basically had five numbers, right? So which, which uh, looked at the probability that the robot is in each one of those states. If you remember the door open, door closed, so the two states where the door is open or the door is closed and basically I had two numbers that re uh, represented the probability that I was uh, in a state with the door open and the probability that I was in a state with the door closed, right? There's really, there's no need to have any notion of similarity between these states because they were just numbers, right? There's just two, two independent numbers, uh, uh, actually I shouldn't say independent numbers, they were just two numbers that I was using, uh, that I was using for representing this, right? I could have many more such states, not just two, I could even have like a hundred different states which the robot could be in and I would end up using 
100 different numbers for representing the probability. But once I move to this kind of a Gaussian setting, so what is the most important thing apart from the fact that I'm looking at a single true state and a margin of uh, uncertainty around that. Uh, the other important thing is that I'm also looking at a notion of distance in this state space, right? So the, the earlier when I was doing the other belief uh, updates, right, I really did not have a notion of a distance. The, none of the probability uh, distributions that I was dealing with had a notion of distance as an integral part of it. But now when I get, get into a Gaussian family of distributions, so the, uh, the notion of distance becomes very important because I have to compute what is the distance that x is from the mean, right? So very simply there itself. So when I say there is a region of uncertainty around a true state, that means there is a notion of distance that allows me to model this region of uncertainty. Right. So far, I, in, the, in the base filter algorithm, I didn't quite need to have a notion of distance. Right? It's kind of moot, right? If you think about it, uh, in in, uh, in almost any robotic problem that we are looking at, we would have the we would have a notion of distance, very natural notion of distance. So it's not a very uh, uh, very you know critical thing to worry about. But I just wanted to point out that from now onwards, we will have to worry about this notion of distance between the uh, in in the state space. Right? So we actually have to worry about. Uh, space that has a distance defined on it okay so that would limit the kind of representations that we can use for the uh, 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 state represent the state space okay and another thing to note here is that in the earlier case right so when we had like five or six uh, let's say we have five or six states in which uh, the robot could be in and i was using five uh, or six numbers uh, to represent the probability distribution that could have been multiple states uh, which the robot considered as equally good candidates right so my uh, my belief distribution could have been multimodal right but when i actually look at uh, uh, simple uh, uh, gaussian uh, distributions uh, when I, when i start looking at a single gaussian distribution right uh, it actually turns out to be a, a poor choice uh, when uh, these kinds of multiple uh, hypotheses could exist right if this could, the belief distribution could be multimodal uh, then a gaussian cannot capture it Right. So all of this is great, but uh, the Gaussian assumption is a very powerful assumption because it makes computation rather simple and it is not often the case that uh, we end up in uh, situations where there are multiple uh, distinct hypotheses and therefore uh, Gaussian filters are uh, a very popular family of filters that are used very widely in practice. Okay. So the first uh, Gaussian filter that we are going to look at uh, is called the Kalman filter. Right. Uh, so apart from assuming that uh, the belief is uh, 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 belief is uh, uh, a Gaussian, right? Uh, the Kalman filter makes the following assumptions about the uh, Gaussian uh, distribution, right? Uh, so so we already know that uh, the uh, dynamics, uh, both the uh, the movement model, the motion model, as well as the measurement models, right? Both of these are uh, satisfying the Markov assumption, right? Uh, but now we, in addition, we are going to assume the following for the motion model, right? The first thing we'll assume is uh, the system follows a linear motion model. So what do I mean by that? So the, the, the state transition expression is given by that, right? So if I'm given xt minus 1 and I'm given ut, so the new x is determined by a linear combination of uh, uh, at xt minus 1, a, but at is just a set of coefficients for xt minus 1 and bt times ut, right? Again, a set of coefficients for ut, right? plus some kind of a noise to account for the stochasticity. Remember we had earlier we had the probability of right the state transition prob we had this probability expression right what's, what's the probability of xt given ut and xt minus 1 right to account for this noise right account for the probability so we are going to assume that there is a noise term which is given by epsilon t right let me repeat it again so the dynamics is linear in the sense that xt is given by xt minus 1 times some coefficients at with a basically constant plus uh, uh, ut which is the action that you take at time t times some other set of uh, coefficients right so so xt this whole expression is linear in both xt minus 1 and in ut and to take care of uh, the stochasticity we actually assume that there is an additive noise uh, uh, denoted by epsilon t and this additive noise is assumed to be zero mean and with the variance rt right it's assumed to be a gaussian with zero mean 
and the variance of rt right so this is what this notation is so epsilon t is assumed to be a gaussian random variable a gaussian noise random variable right with zero mean and a covariance of rt right so this essentially means that if you keep on repeating this transition many many times i mean i go to x from x t minus 1 i apply ut and i end up at x t right so the noise would average out right so so i'll i'll basically have zero noise and then the linear model will be the correct prediction just just the the linear part alone right so without the just uh, this part alone would make the correct prediction in expectation so that's essentially what we are assuming yeah right now the total state transition probability remember that is what we are interested in right the total state transition probability p of xt given ut and xt minus 1 uh, can now be written as a gaussian variable whose mean is given by the linear part of the dynamics right at xt minus 1 plus bt ut and the covariance is given by rt which is the covariance of the noise right so this is fairly straightforward right so i take a gaussian random variable and i add a, a, a deterministic fixed quantity to it right uh, so therefore uh, the overall distribution of the entire expression is now uh, has a mean of that fixed quantity that i added because the originally it was zero mean and now and the covariance stays the same because there is no noise in the term here okay make sense and of course i can uh, i can write it out in uh, in a little bit more scary form but this is the uh, actually the uh, the uh, the multivariate gaussian distribution uh, written out with the mean uh, at xt minus 1 and uh, and uh, plus bt ut and the covariance of rt right it's it's, it's uh, rather straightforward right so don't get scared with this expression okay so just to recap uh, we are assuming that the motion model follows a linear dynamics right so there is xt minus 1 and that is ut and the expression for xt is basically linear in both xt minus 1 and in ut plus an additive gaussian noise which is zero mean and with a covariance of rt okay so i hope i hope that is uh, clear to people and uh, so what are the other assumptions we make the second assumption we make is that the measurement probability right the measurement model uh, should also be linear in its arguments right so what is the argument of the measurement model remember the measurement model we are looking at the probability of zt which is the measurement at time t given the state is xt okay so that translates to in a linear model that translates to this expression so zt equal some set of coefficients ct times xt plus a noise model delta t right now we had like epsilon t earlier now we will use a noise model that is given by delta t right and so delta t is again a zero mean gaussian with the covariance denoted by q t right so earlier when i was specifying the uh, uh, motion model right so earlier let's go back uh, when i would have specified the motion model i, I would have needed to give you this distribution right so and how did we do it when we did the example so for every value that u t and x t minus uh, minus uh, one could take, we specified the probability for every value that x t could take, right? If you remember the uh, sample uh, example that we looked at, right? For every value that x t minus one and u t could take, we and, and for every value that x t could take, we specified a probability, right? But now our job is slightly simpler, so we don't have to run over all possible values of this. Uh, if I want to specify the uh, state transition probability. All I need to specify are RT, AT, and BT, right? So I have to specify AT, I have to specify BT, and I have to specify RT to specify the full for, uh, transition model. Okay. Likewise, uh, for uh, the measurement model, I have to specify CT, which is the co linear coefficients uh, uh, for the measurement model, as well as QT, which is the covariance matrix of the noise. That I add in the measurement model, right? So the overall measurement probability again is given by a Gaussian, with the mean is given by ct xt and the covariance which is given by qt. Just similar arguments as we had in the previous slide. Okay, so makes sense. And because I am adding a zero mean uh, 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 Gaussian variable with qt as a standard deviation to a fixed quantity, so the overall probability distribution has a mean of ct and xt, ct xt and a covariance of qt right now again i can write it out in the 
uh, uh, the full uh, multivariate uh, Gaussian expression, which is basically this. Right? Then what is the third assumption that I am making? I said I am making three assumptions. So, the third assumption I am making is that uh, the initial belief distribution I start with, right, which is bell x naught, if you remember, right. So, that is something that I start with the initial distribution. And um, earlier, so we had actually uh, thought of it as um, something uniform, right. In the, in, the, in, the, in the numeric example we looked at, we had bell x naught equal to open as 0.5, bell x naught equal to close as 0.5. Again, uh, the belief was uh, just a set of numbers, right. But here, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, our entire computation is tractable, uh, we assume that the belief distribution is also given by a normal distribution, just like the noise that we had in the two models, right. And we assume that the mean is mu naught and the covariance matrix is sigma naught, right. And uh, so basically that is uh, the expression. So we have uh, n of mu naught sigma naught and therefore bell x naught, which was the, uh, is the distribution, uh, uh, belief distribution at time 0, is essentially given by a covariance matrix. Uh, with mean uh, mu 0 and, and uh, variance uh, covariance uh, sigma 0 right and therefore you can you can see what is going to happen. So, bell x naught has mean mu 0 and sigma 0. So, bell x 1 would have a mean of mu 1 and sigma 1 right. Remember that the measurement mo model and the uh, the motion model right uh, the transition models do not change they are given to you a priori right. So, you have using that and then you are only refining your belief over time right. What will change are the actions and the measurements you take, but the model themselves would stay fixed, right, or the distributions themselves would stay fixed, right. So, your AD, AT, BT and CT uh, and your uh, RT and QT do not change, right. But on the other hand, the belief keeps changing at every time step because that is what you are updating in order to uh, uh, estimate the state, right, or in order to localize yourself as we will see later, right. So, uh, so your uh, uh, your belief distribution will keep getting updated. So, bell x naught is given by mu naught and sigma naught and bell x 1 would be given by mu 1 and sigma 1, bell x 2 would be given by mu 2 and sigma 2 and so on and so forth. And uh, your entire base filter algorithm will now reduce to an algorithm where you update mu t and sigma t given mu t minus 1 and sigma t minus 1 and u t and z t. Is that, is that clear? So, your belief distribution now is the one that gets updated. Therefore, your mu naught and sigma naught will keep getting updated. And so, you will maintain your belief just by updating these true values. Okay. So, just to recap, uh, your system dynamics is defined by multiple quantities. You have AT, you have BT, you have CT, then you have RT and you have QT. Right? So, these are the quantities that need to be defined for specifying your system model that is both the transition probability and the measurement probability. Okay. And for representing your belief you need two quantities which is mu and sigma. So, you start off with some basic assumption mu naught and you start uh, and sigma naught right. It could be a very very flat Gaussian distribution if you will right without a very significant concentration at the mean right. The sigma sigma naught can actually spread out the probability distribution as much as you want. Uh, but uh, the more informed your prior distribution is, the more quickly you are going to converge to uh, something meaningful. And at every time step, you use your system parameters and your current action and measurements in order to update your belief distribution as to where you are in the state. And hopefully, as you keep moving around, right, your belief becomes more and more concentrated around the actual state. Okay, so, and we will see uh, how this operates in a bit. So, uh, like we said, so we are going to estimate uh, belief x uh, x t uh, uh, based on uh, belief x t minus one u t and z t, right? So, very similar to the base filter algorithm. So, these are the steps of the Kalman filter algorithm, right? And uh, steps two and three, right, are actually updating bell bar, right? Steps two and three, right, are updating bell bar, right? Steps four, five, and six are updating bell x t right. So, so 2 and 3 update bell bar x t, 4, 5 and 6 are for computing bell x t. So, I am not going to get into the complete derivation of the Kalman filter here right, it is it's, it's a little cumbersome. And so, what uh, we would do is uh, give you some uh, material to read up if you are interested in looking at the derivation 
right uh, alternatively i mean so you this is something that you could uh, just uh, you know take on faith right and then say oh yeah this looks like the right expression but i'm not going to let you do that right so i'll, I'll give you some material so you can look it up yourself but uh, so uh, so essentially the point here is that uh, this is more additional reading for you to look at how the derivation comes out right so the idea here is that uh, so mu bar and sigma bar are going to represent my bell bar right and if you look at it it, it kind of makes sense right intuitively it makes sense so what is my mu uh, mu uh, mu t hat is right so i'm going to take my old mu t minus 1 which is uh, i have that right because i know bell xt minus 1 right so bell xt minus 1 is represented by these two entities right mu t minus 1 and sigma t minus 1 so i know my mu t minus 1 which is essentially my uh, uh, my previous uh, um, position right my, my expected position in the previous time step right so i'm going to assume that hey look I am going to take mu t minus 1, right, and I am going to apply u t to that, right. I am taking mu t minus 1, which is my previous position. I am applying u t to that, right, and this is the linear part of my model, right. This is the linear part of the model. If you remember that, right. So you had a times x t minus 1 plus b times u t, right, gives you x t plus 1, right, plus there was this noise term epsilon t right that was giving you ut plus so now what we are going to do is that epsilon t right is essentially uh, given you given to you by rt right so what is what is that epsilon t going to do it is going to basically make you more confused about where you are so your initial confusion was sigma t minus 1 right your initial confusion about where you are was sigma t minus 1 and rt is the additional noise right that you are adding right rt is additional uh, uh, noise you are adding that's a covariance uh, matrix for the uh, the transition right so that's additional noise in the transition so your sigma t bar basically is a function of your original noise where you are your original uncertainty about your belief that you are at mu t minus 1 plus the new noise that is introduced by the motion right so so mu t bar and sigma t bar together gives you bell bar of xt okay now that is basically your motion uh, model or the prediction right the, the belief belief after you do the prediction right and then that's your prediction update and now this is your correction update or your measurement update and essentially uh, so this uh, quantity here is called the kalman gain as we'll uh, note in the next slide as well this quantity is called the kalman gain and uh, so your mu t bar which is where you assume you are is corrected right by the measurement that you make right so the zt is the actual measurement you make and ct mu t bar is the prediction the, the measurement the linear part of the measurement model right that you have right remember so ct mu t bar is okay if i was at really at mu t bar okay and so this is the measurement i should have made if there was no noise right but zt is the actual measurement i make so that difference is basically uh, uh, going to uh, change what my mean is right and likewise i have a complex function here that also tells me how much noise i have to add based on the actual noise that is expected in the measurements okay so that gives me my new sigma t so this part of the derivation is a little uh, not too hard right there's just a little involved and I encourage you to just follow it offline. Okay, so at the end of both these updates, so this is the prediction update, and that is the uh, 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 the um, uh, measurement update. So there's a prediction update, and then you have the measurement update, and after that you get the new belief state, which is given to you by mu t sigma t. Right. So, this is, this is exactly what we were saying earlier, right. So, lines 2 to 3 are the prediction step, right, right, and lines 4, 5, and 6 are the measurement update, and the kt that we compute in line 4, as you saw earlier, right, is called the Kalman gain. So, the kt is called the Kalman gain, right, 2 to 3 are the measurement updates, I'm sorry, 2 to 3 are the prediction updates, and 4, 5, and 6 are the measurement updates, sorry, right. 
So I, ho I hope that's uh, that's clear. So the Kalman filter makes very strong assumptions, right? It assumes a that the dynamics are all linear, right? The main component of the dynamics is linear, right? The motion model is linear. The measurement model is linear. So these are this is a very strong assumption that it makes. And the second assumption it makes is that the noise or the probability distribution that you are seeing for both the motion model and the measurement model, the, the noise more is, is Gaussian. And it also assumes that the belief is a Gaussian distribution. So basically there are three things. So the linearity assumption, right? And the Gaussian assumption on all the three models that you use. Okay. So this makes the life a little easier, right? So you could basically I mean, if you think about it, these updates are actually just simple matrix multiplications, right? You can very easily implement it on your favorite uh, uh, tool, right? MATLAB or whatever is it that you have. These are simple matrix multiplication and inverse operations. So you can implement it uh, very efficiently. And you don't have to worry about uh, the computational difficulty that I was pointing out uh, in looking at the normalizing factor. And it is also nice in a way because everything is Gaussian, right? You're guaranteed that at every state, your Bayesian, uh, your uh, uh, at every state, your belief distribution as well is Gaussian, right? If you start off with a Gaussian belief, it will stay a Gaussian uh, distribution because your dynamics and your measurement model both have Gaussian noise. So this is the reason we make this strong assumption because it makes computation so simple, okay? And the reason the Kalman filters are very popular, Kalman filters and their uh, family of uh, uh, filtering algorithms are very popular is because these assumptions do work in practice, right? And or slightly, slightly stronger versions of this uh, work in practice, right? And so let's look at how the uh, the whole Kalman filter uh, uh, thing will uh, look like. So let's take a simple uh, uh, one-dimensional localization scenario, right? Uh, so I have a robot uh, that is moving on the uh, horizontal axis, right? Moving in x x coordinate. I, I'm interested only in looking at what is the displacement of the robot along the x coordinate right so i'm just looking at this right i'm not i'm going to assume that the robot does not move in any other direction right i'm not worried about the effectors of the robot or anything so my state is only the displacement along this line just to make things a little easy and uh, easier to visualize and to draw as well right and i also assume that the robot has a, a gps sensor that can basically query its location and the, and the sensor has some amount of noise, obviously, especially if the robot is indoor, the sensor is going to have a lot of noise. But for the time being, let's assume that uh, uh, we have a GPS sensor uh, that gives you a rough idea of what the location is, right? And uh, we are also going to assume uh, whatever we had looked at earlier, that uh, the motion model is linear, right? So in terms of the velocity with which the uh, robot moves, at the original location, so we can write a linear model as to what its new location should be. And we are also going to assume that the measurement model is linear with Gaussian noise, right? So this is how the Kalman filter is going to look like. So I'm going to start off with some initial beliefs. So let's look at one diagram at a time, right? So let's let's look at this one, right? That's the first, uh, that's the initial belief. Let's look at the initial belief alone, right? So I, this is the belief that I'm starting off with. So what does this mean? This means that that is my mu t, right? That is my mu t. And I have some kind of a sigma t that represents the current belief, uh, current noise in the belief or current uncertainty in the belief that I am at this uh, 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 mu t, right? So that will be my mu t and I'll have a sigma t here, right? Now what do I do is, I actually make a measurement. So this is my first thing to do. I make a measurement, right? So the measurement tells me, hey, look, this is where you are likely to be. So the measurement uh, mean is here, right? The measurements mean is here and the noise in the measurement is this much. So this is basically what my uh, measurement model tells me, right? Now, once I incorporate this uncertainty into my location, Right. So, so you can think of it as I don't move at all, so my belief doesn't change because I didn't make any movement. So no, 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 no op. So my belief, at my location doesn't change. So my bell bar is the same as my bell, right? Bell x t minus one is the same as bell bar x t because I did no movement, right? And then now I do a measurement. So given that this is the noise associated with the measurement update that I have made, right? Now I re, uh, I, I basically incorporate 
my original noise which is this which is my remember now this is now my bell bar of xt plus my measurement right now these two together right so give me that as my belief state right okay, so that is my belief right after this now what i do is i move to the right right so basically i say that i'm moving to the right here okay now after i move to the right i have to now apply my movement model right so i know what my action is my action was moved to the right i apply my movement model now my movement model also has some kind of noise in it right so what happens is even though i was so certain about where i started out right this is where i started out this is my bell xt now right this is my bell xt now my bell bar xt plus 1 becomes a lot more noisier but at least you can see that the mean has shifted to where it should be so this was where the original mean was right this is where the original mean was now that it has shifted here and that is the effect of the linear part of the model and the fact that the variance is now increased right the variance is increased is because of the noise in the uh, movement model right now after, once i have this right this is my bell bar I make a measurement, right? And the measurement gives me a mean that is somewhere here, right? The, the, that's what the, the measurement model tells me, and that's the noise around the measurement model. So putting these two together, and that is my final belief at x t plus one. So I started at t minus one with the belief of that. Then that was also because I didn't move. That was my belief bell bar of x t x t, right? And then I make a measurement. I integrate that, and I get my bell x t. Then I make a movement here, which a movement was go to the right. right. That kind of shifts my mu t minus one to mu t bar, right? And and also kind of uh, spreads out the uh, uh, probability mass because of the uncertainty in the movement. And then I make a new measurement. So that's the new measurement that I make, and that tells me this is the more likely location. So I combine the bell bar and the measurement. And finally, get my bell x t plus one, right? So that's how the uh, Kalman filter will look will work. So every every point of time, you can see that all the intermediate computations that we do are all Gaussians or all normal distributions. So that makes it easier for us to do the computation. So far, we looked at uh, uh, the the simple uh, Kalman filter algorithm, which uh, assumes everything is uh, Gaussian. But as we know that you know the fact that the movement model and the measurement model are both linear uh, is a very strong assumption so we will look at uh, ways of getting around that uh, one by looking at a slightly uh, different version of the kalman filter and then uh, by looking at other uh, more more, more uh, complex filters as well uh, in the next few lectures